Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Sharangi. I teach English at Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata, West Bengal. Friends, we are into module 6. The title of the module Norman Conquest and its influence on English language and literature. This module is prepared by Dr. Mohan Rai Choudhury, who teaches English at Dirojio College, Kolkata. Friends, first look at the screen, there is a map of Norman conquest. If you are familiar with the map, now see in this particular module, we are going to learn a few aspects, the sociological details, the historical details and the literary influences caused by the Norman conquest in the year 1066 AD. We are also going to look at how the language shipped out of this particular influence of the Norman conquest. So, our mission in this project is in this particular module is to find out to what extent the Norman conquest affected on English language and literature studies. Friends, Norman conquest of England means occupation of England by the Normans, French, Breton soldiers led by Duke William II of Normandy, later William the Conqueror. This particular battle took place in the year 1066 AD in northern England, which was invaded by the Norwegian king Harald Heredita. Harald Heredita emerged victorious at the Battle of Fulford. Harrieta defeated the and killed Harold Battle of Stamford Bridge in September 25 in 1066. William came to southern England. Harold went to confront him in the Battle of Hastings in October 1066. Harold was killed and William emerged as victorious. Now three key figures if you look into screen, there are three key figures of the Norman conquest. Number one on the left hand side, Harold Goldwinson, the Earl of Wessex. Then William, Duke of Normandy in the middle. Then Harold Herodotta, King of Norway. So these three men are instrumental, are very vital to the core of this Norman conquest in England. Now, friends, a few measures adopted to gain control over this particular issue. Several revolts and rebellions over the quite long time, even after the victory of William the Normandy. William's position in the, Eng in the English throne not secure till 1062. Normans had to face several ob obstacles to maintain control over social and political issues. Followers of William received titles and lands as reward for their service in the invasion. William possessed de facto control over the land and territory of England in particular. Castles and fortifications were constructed because as we all know, castles and fortifications are instruments of cultural control and it is a political invasion. Therefore, castles had to be rebuilt and totally controlled by the Normans. Control over inheritance of property by daughters and window, widows. The new law terms, the law practices came into England. Compulsive marriages to Normans. This is another strategic alliance or strategic adaptation by the Normans. William, an absolute ruler. The ruler uh, in absentee, William worked out setting up royal administrative structures to rule England from a distance. This had to be made because for England was being dominated by France. France was far away. So, there was some machinery which was rebuilt and reconstructed in order to execute the power and control in, in, in the British island. Friends, now the consequences of the great Norman conquest. Immediate immigration of Engla English lords and nobles, that means 
they had to go away, weeping away the existing English aristocracy. So, English aristocracy was under in bewilder bewilderment because they were been now occupied by the French masters. Loss of control of the English over the Catholic Church in England because that was another territory which was captured by the French. Basic framework of the government retained by the Normans again because it was not a control a, a militaristic control, but also as a political control. So, the political houses were dominated by the Normans. Most of the officials of the royal family as well as the government officials were Normans. It had to be because it was a total supremacy by the Normans and they had to execute it. They execute their power in all spheres of life in England. The official language used in documents changed from Old English to Latin. This is a very structural move to Latin. Introduction of the forest laws, the new laws were incorporated. Intermarriage common in the st all strata of society, decrease of the slavery system in England and dialect of language dual Anglo-Norman or Anglo-Norman French. Now, from the Anglo-Saxon language is which looked like Anglo-French or Anglo-Norman or Anglo-Norman French language. Now, friends, let us talk about something about the influence on English language. The French became the language of the king and his court. So, French became the language of aristocracy and placed people associated with power and control. 1275 AD, the first official document written in Anglo Norman. So, from Anglo Saxon to ship to Anglo Norman. So, it is also a linguistic control as soon as the militaristic control is completed. Norman language in England took a new form which was low French since the end of the 14th century and it was a kind of hybrid kind of language third language emerged out of interaction between Anglo Norman and Anglo Saxon and to some extent and low French language was concocted and that became the lingua franca of the people around there. Low French technical language which is a particular which is a particular vocabulary a stereotype vocabulary which is an interlanguage between Anglo Saxon as well as Anglo Norman. The grammatical rules and morphology pertaining to French not maintained so stringently. So, there was some kind of flexibility in all aspects. Norman language in England took a new form which was low French since the end of the 15th century. Low French technical language with a particular vocabulary, grammatical rules and morphology pertaining to French not maintained stringently. Now, the language of the people French became popular and became Im and emerged as a second language enjoyed aristocratic association and prestigious status because English what was English now French became that status. Medium of instruction in schools through Latin and now it is also French. Language of business and communication churches selected French for communicating with the non-religious people. So, almost in every sphere of life in England French became an important language. Language of the people, jury members had to understand French in order to comprehend the arguments and appeals of the lawyers, commercials and private correspondences made in Anglo-Norman or Anglo-French. Now, influence of French on English language, French borrowings, it is related to diverse spheres and aspects of English life and society. First, words related to administrative and governmental affairs, crown like crown, reign, minister, parliament and nation. Similarly, words related to military affairs like peace, army, lieutenant. Words related to feudalism, noble, glory, honor, peer. Words related to legal matters, plaintiff, attorney, session, 
words related to ecclesiastical matters, saint, altar, clergy, words related to relationships like nephew, niece, cousin, words related to food like pastry, soup, fry, boil, toast words related to morality like uh, charity, virtue, vice, chaste, mercy, words related to fashion like costume, apparel, garment, dress and fashion, words related to architecture like tower, arc, porch, castle and column, words related to sports like dice, trump, egg, deuce, curse, words related to exclamation like adieu, Alas, now after a brief discussions on language, let us switch over to reasons for easy assimilation into English. Why did the French was assimilated into English language? The presence of corresponding old English words of common Germanic origin. Number two, synonyms, very crucial in the process of assimilation. Number three, certain similarities in grammar of both the languages. Now friends, we should know about hybridism, that means composite word formation. Composite words were created by an amalgamation of elements from diverse languages. Few instances of hybrids formed by the combination of French and English words can be mentioned. First. French prefix plus English word that means dis plus believe, disbelieve, reaper plus birth, rebirth. Then English prefix plus French word, example un plus pleasant, unpleasant, out plus cry, outcry. Third, English word plus French ending, drink plus able, drinkable, phobia plus earrings, forbearance. Next one, French word plus English ending. Prince plus Lee, Prince Lee, color plus less, colorless. Friends, as we have viewed how the Norman conquest affected English language, literature and culture. As you all understand, historically speaking, the Norman conquest was of great importance. It changed the culture, sociological pattern, structures, society language, literature of the British people. So, it was not, an not a kind of militaristic invasion, it was a cultural invasion as well. By cultural invasion, we understand the linguistic invasion as well as the invasion in the spheres of sociological patterns, administrative discourses and so on. In this particular module, we try to map out to what extent the Norman conquest influenced English language and literature in particular. For references, P. K. Bose, A Manual of English Philology, Marjorie Kiblin, Anglo-Norman England 1066 to 1166, David Crystal, I think the must read book, The Story of Middle English, The English Language, A Guided Tour of the Language. Penguin publication 2004. Richard Huscroft, The Norman Conquest, A New Introduction, Longman publication 2009. And Anthony Lodge, A Sociolinguistic History of uh, Persian French, Cambridge University Press 2004. I think you also should note some audio visual links, here are them on the screen, please enjoy. Thank you. The night is dark. The storm in the English Channel has gone.
Across the water, a fleet of ships begins to appear on the horizon. The night watch sound the alarm. Messengers must be sent to take the grim news to King Harold in the north. The year is 1066, and the Norman conquest of England is about to begin. Exactly why William, Duke of Normandy, decided to invade England is not known. The Saxon king, Edward, had originally promised the throne of England to William, who was his nephew. But in the beautiful Bayer tapestry, made for the Normans some years later, it is suggested that Edward changed his mind as he lay dying, entrusting the throne to Harold, one of his Saxon earls. Whatever the answer is, the history of the Normans remains a remarkable story. 150 years before the invasion of England, after many years of Viking attacks, a reluctant King of France allowed a group of Vikings from Denmark to settle on the coast opposite England. This became known as Normandy, the land of the Northmen, or Normans. For more than 200 years, the Normans were a powerful force in the changing history of Europe. They conquered England. They overran parts of Scotland and Ireland. They made conquests in Italy and Sicily. And their power spread as far as the great city of Antioch, in what is now modern Syria. The Bayer tapestry shows us what a fearsome fighting force the Normans were and their most dramatic achievement was the conquest of England. At the time of the Norman invasion, Saxon England was a wealthy society. The rich soil provided plenty of food, as it does today. Large areas of woodland offered good hunting and sport for the rulers, as well as timber for ships and houses. Towns and cities, like London and York, were important centres of industry and trade at the time. William knew the value of England well, and for the restless, ambitious Normans, England was a rich prize. On the night of September the 27th, 1066, they set sail from France. Here, in Sussex, where Battle Abbey now stands on the ridge of this hill, the Norman and Saxon armies met. The fury of the struggle that took place here more than 900 years ago, the clash of steel, the cries of the dying, has long since faded. It was here that Earl Harold, now King of England, was killed and the Saxon army defeated. To mark the event, William built a monastery on the very place that Harold died. Later, it was replaced with the buildings that we can see now. The Battle of Hastings lasted for a day, but the conquest of England took very much longer. In 1068, William had to go south to crush a rebellion in Exeter. The next year, he was faced with a series of uprisings in the north around York. And it was three more years before he was able to defeat Hereward the Wake in the marshes of the Fenlands near Cambridge. During this period, and the years that followed, the Normans worked hard to protect their conquest. This is Berkhamsted Castle in Hertfordshire, a reminder today of those troubled times. Although little of the original castle has survived, we can imagine how it looked when it was built shortly after the Battle of Hastings. Like many Norman castles, it began as a wooden fortress, built as fast as possible with the materials that could be found nearby. It was surrounded by a defensive ditch, which we can still see today. And remember, this had to be dug by hand. Within the ditch, an earth bank originally topped by a wooden stockade enclosed a courtyard called the Bailey. Inside, there would have been a hall, barracks for the soldiers, living quarters for people and animals, and a chapel.
Looking across the bailey, we can see a large mound called a mot. On top of this, there was a wooden tower, or keep, again surrounded by a stockade. No attacking army could capture the castle without climbing the steep slopes of the mot and taking the keep from its Norman defenders. The wooden tower has long since gone, and today we see the remains of stone buildings. As the Normans established themselves, they could take the time to rebuild their wooden castles in stone. There are many Norman castles that survive today, but few are more impressive than the Tower of London. It was begun in 1068 as a simple earth fort built to house soldiers shortly after William's army entered London and crowned their leader, King of England. Ten years later, the stone construction of the White Tower began. This building was designed not only to be defended, but also to show how important the king was. Over the years, many similar castles were built. Rochester Castle, with its square keep, overlooks the Medway and protected the vital river crossing on the supply route to Dover and France. So it was an important military building. But it's easy to forget when one looks at the ruins today that castles like these were also designed to be lived in. The entrance to the castle was on the first floor. Here, people from the surrounding countryside came to discuss business with the Lord and his officials. Below, we see the basement of the castle. Here were the kitchens and storage areas. We can imagine food being prepared and carried up to the great hall. Only the Lord and his invited guests could gather here. As we go up from floor to floor, the rooms become more private. The Lord and his family lived at the very top. And from the top of the castle, we can look out and see Rochester Cathedral. Religion was important to the Normans. William was certain that God had helped him to win the Battle of Hastings. And throughout the country, magnificent buildings like this reflect a deep respect. This becomes clear when we go inside. The Normans had a particular style of building, and you can usually tell if a cathedral or church is Norman by looking for certain features. The buildings are very solid. They almost seem to have been hollowed out from rock. The columns have a round barrel shape. They rise up to form great round-headed arches. You can see that these are decorated with zigzag patterns. This is a typical Norman feature. Sometimes the decoration is quite simple. And sometimes the carving is very elaborate. Another common feature is called blind arcading. Rows of round-headed arches decorating the walls. But you'll often have to look hard for these clues. In this corner of the cathedral, the blind arcading has almost been destroyed by a large window put in many years later. Again, in another part of the cathedral, we can see how a different type of arch has been built several hundred years later, and this too has been cut down the middle by other builders. You can see how different the styles are. Rochester Cathedral, like many other Norman buildings, was always being changed and added to, and in some places it's very hard to find the original Norman work. This is Durham Cathedral, and if we look closely, we can see the same Norman details. A solid mass of stone. Round-headed arches. Sturdy columns, 
zigzag patterns. Blind arcading. A castle of God to rival those of King. And just as King William built Battle Abbey, a thanksgiving to God for his success, his barons followed his lead and built churches and monasteries throughout the land. Although they were important buildings in their day, many are now ruins. You'll have to look very hard to find traces of the original Norman building. But the clues are there. It's not just in the great cathedrals and abbeys that we can see the care and attention that the Normans gave to religious buildings. This is a small church in the village of Kilpeck, near Hereford. Inside, the church is very plain and simple. The round-headed arches and windows are typically Norman, and the building also looks very solid. By contrast, the outside is richly decorated. Even roof supports are carved. Now look closely at the doorway. Here you can see the zigzag patterns again, but they form part of a rich, elaborate design. Let's look in more detail. The strange design is a reminder that the Normans were the descendants of Vikings. Kilpeck is unusual because it's so richly decorated, but carved Norman doorways can be found on many village churches. Even Norman houses, like this one in Lincoln, have the same shaped windows and doors. But it's not just the buildings that come from the Normans, but also part of our landscape. In front of this small village church, you can see some earth banks and ditches. You can see these in many villages. They're the remains of small Mott and Bailey castles, like the one we saw at Berkhamsted. They were built by the Normans to protect the village, but are now almost forgotten. And we can see the influence of the Normans even in the fields around our towns and villages. Norman farmers divided the fields into narrow strips, and the shapes of these can still be seen as ridges and furrows in the modern fields. The English forests were also important to the Normans. They loved hunting, so much so that William closed off parts of the country just for him to hunt in, and his barons did the same on their own estates. The New Forest, now more than 900 years old, is one example of the many royal forests. It was here that William hunted, and here that his son and successor, William Rufus, was accidentally killed by a hunter's arrow 44 years after the invasion. Because of the size and wealth of England, William wanted to learn more about his conquest which of his followers owned what property, and how much it was worth. A survey was made, which still survives today. It's known as the Doomsday Book. By the time the Doomsday Book was complete, William knew exactly what he had acquired when he conquered England. But the Normans left more than this. If you open an English dictionary at any page, you'll find many words that were originally French brought into our language with the Norman conquest. Even the name of your local streets or the name of your family may have its beginnings in Normandy. But more than anything, they left clues about themselves in our landscape and our buildings. In many places, the evidence is not hard to find. But in other places, it's much less obvious. Look at this old church in Norfolk. At first glance, there's nothing Norman about the building. But at the back, behind a rusty tin shed, a Norman doorway, round-headed, beautifully carved, and almost forgotten. This is the evidence from the past. It may be found in your town or village.